Hi, this is Doug Paddy, Pinhead from the Hellways and Movies, and you are listening to Without Your Head. And you better keep listening to Without Your Head, or you will not only be without your head, you will be without your soul, because I will tear it apart. Welcome to the Station of Decapitation Without Your Head. I'm Nasty Neal, and I'm joined by Miguel Nunez Jr. of classic films like Return Living Dead, Friday 13th Part 5, Joanna Man. And he's got a new movie coming out, <laughs> Worth. And uh, I think it's out right now on Amazon Prime and Tubi. Uh, can you give an idea of what Worth is about? Okay, Worth is about a guy who's an MMA fighter. And, you know, he gets in trouble. And it's kind of like a love story. And it's a love story between a fighter and his, um, and his, his love for a girl. <laughs> Hold on a second. Uh, uh, Getting all choked up talking about love. No. <laughs> anyway, he's um he gets into a fight and he gets into an accident and his girl is put into a coma. And the only way he can pay for it is by fighting. And that's mm-hmm. what it's about. It's about a guy, all he goes through and all he's willing to put for for the love of somebody. And that's pretty much basically what it's about. Yeah. Now you play uh, uh, Doctor Harris in it, but do you, do you yourself? Does Miguel have any background in in fighting, in boxing or MMA? Oh hell no, I ain't got no <laughs> MMA experience. I like watching it though, but you know uh-huh. sometimes get a little bit too much of me because I don't think they stop it quick enough. But my character mm-hmm. is pretty much you know I'm like a mentor, uh, and, mm-hmm. and I'm like a mentor to to him, to the family. And I'm like the conscience of it. So I bring some stability, some conscience, and I kind of lead him. You know, I'm like the, he, I'm like his mentor. It's like mm-hmm. in a emo- very emotional movie, and I'm bringing some dramatic emotional aspects to it as, as the doctor, who's also kind of like a counselor and a friend. Mm-hmm. But that's what I bring. Now, uh, Eduardo uh, Castrillo, he wrote it, uh, directed it, and he stars in it. How, how does that work when um, the directors also star in the movie? Well, you know what? When you write and direct it, it's easier. Mm-hmm. It's a lot easier. He is really a truly, true, truly brilliant, brilliant director, writer, actor. He has his pulse on every single aspect. When you're somebody who just wants to do it for ego, it shows. And you bumble against and you stumble against the directing part. You stumble against the acting. You may slip on one or something and it may be too much for you. And then you say, well, yeah, he should have did this. He should have did that. But when you have your pulse, your total amazingly creative pulse on every aspect of the story, of the script and everything, it's a lot easier. And this guy is a genius, a true genius. He puts these things together all by himself, him and his mother and his family. I mean, it's just amazing. Mm-hmm. And there's also some, um, you know, uh, real MMA fighters in the movie. Uh, how oh, do you yeah. think they did as far as, uh, you know, uh, going to the world of acting? Well, see, the thing about it is when you look at it and it's so, so much action and it's so much emotion, it's easy for an MMA player. If you had an MMA player and you wanted to put him in a movie playing an uh, uh, emotional detective, then he's mm-hmm. stretching out of his lane. But when, when I land, and going back to Eduardo again, to, to his genius, if you hire somebody, and that's why some films, you know, you say, I, don't, I didn't know anybody in that movie, but that movie was brilliant. Mm-hmm. Because it's not about having some big names in it. It's about somebody filling the post and keeping people in their lane. The MMA fighters, they deal with emotions. They deal with this. So it's easier for them to get in there and deal with it and play it and give and portray those emotions and the the intensity of it because that's what they do automatically. So he put people right in their lanes. So even if you swerve from here on one side of your lane and to the other side of your lane, you're still in your lane and you never know because you're in the lane doing what you do. And that's what those MMA fighters, they're brilliant. They do what they do and they're in their lanes. So you just, it, it, it works perfectly. Yeah. Now, I've, something I've always wanted to ask you, so 1985, both Return of the Living Dead and Friday the 13th Part 5 comes out. And so you don't, you're not like yeah. named Billy or Steve or anything. Both these movies, you have, you're Spider and Demon. So what was it about, yeah. about, about Miguel that, like, we're going to name this guy, you know, Spider and Demon? No, no, no. Those were just the names of the characters when I went in to audition. <laughs> they were the names of the oh, characters. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
happened to be the names of the characters. Right. <laughs> of the characters. Yeah. So yeah. I've uh, done a lot of interviews with uh, Cast Return Living Dead. And uh, they always bring up the fact that everyone like had a lot of chemistry was because you guys had a uh, rehearsal time. Uh, would you say that's true? And is that something that happens often? Well, I think well, I think it was that, and the mm -hmm. fact that we were all young, excited, and there's a difference between a young, excited, and, and, and hungry actor. We were all new, young, excited. And, and we were just so excited to be on there. We were all opening because once the actor already been through it, they don't, they lose that openness. They lose that, but they still have all the talent. And then they start going to set strictly whirling on their talents. Hey, how you doing other people? But we were young, open. It was like my first movie. I was still homeless at the time. There was all, everybody was young. We didn't know that the gravity of that film. We didn't know that you know, 30 years later, the thing would still have people packing in and hundreds of thousands of people coming from all over the world to get an autograph for it. We didn't know this. We just were just young and hungry and, and, and we were, and that rehearsal did help. I don't know if that rehearsal helped us become of a family more so than just being way out all the time, every day. And everybody was young and hungry and we didn't know nothing about the business. And we were just so excited about having a job and we were just all trying to do the best we could and outdo each other. It was just a real a family-like atmosphere like you would if you had brothers and sisters. Right. So I didn't know that, that you were you were homeless when you... Uh, so how long were you homeless? Well, I ran away from home to become an actor. I came to California. I landed here with $2 in my pocket. I lived in the street, ate out of the trash. I did a whole nine. I went through that. That's a whole nother show. Uh -huh. I went through huh. the whole nine yards. And, um, yeah, I was homeless from... I got here in October. And uh, I, I, well, I was homeless about six months, but then I went to the Union Rescue Mission. I lived at the Union Rescue Mission for about another four or five months. And that was worse than being homeless because that was where I caught all the, I wake up with lice on me because it was just a room they let you sleep with bums. And I had to get sprayed with poison every morning to kill the lice because I couldn't stop scratching. And that was just as bad as homeless, but at least I was inside. And then I yeah. moved to the Union Rescue Mission, and then I probably, and then three years later from the time of that, I was on tour of duty of Vietnam show on CBS. Wow. Now, you talked about being hungry for the movie. Does an experience like that um, keep that uh, in you, like this hunger? Like, you know, obviously you're doing good at stuff, but like the, the, uh, the thought that, like, you, you, know, you know, I was homeless, I definitely don't want to go back to that at some point. Well, even when I... Listen to me. This is weird because that's a very good point, and I've never, ever brought this point up until now, and I've talked about this a million times. Mm -hmm. I was homeless, but to me, I wasn't homeless in my mind. Mm -hmm. Because I literally 100 million percent knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was going to make it and every single thing I thought was going to be true. I knew I was going to have my own movies. I knew I was going to be a movie star. I knew I was going to be it. I knew it. So in my mind, I knew this, but in my condition, I was homeless. But in my mind, I wasn't homeless. In my mind, I already saw it. I know I'm going to be honest. In my mind, I saw that. So I, I didn't look at my circumstances. Uh, I, I looked at the, 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 my, the, the prize. I looked at the end. And that was one of the things I think kept me going. I just knew it. I didn't think it. I didn't hope it. I didn't say if I work hard, it's going to happen. I literally knew it when I was eating, working in a farm in North Carolina. When I wrote, took a magic marker and wrote it on the back of a jean jacket in the first grade, and I could still wear the same jacket when I graduated. And I had the same jean jacket on. It had Hollywood on the back of the jean jacket on a farm in North Carolina. And every single person that I ever ran into told me, nigga, you skinny, you ugly, you black, you poor, you're in a farm. How in the hell are you going to become an actor? It, it's not humanly possible for every person I ever ran into. Not one person my entire life said to use it's possible. And then when I got to California living in the street, I started telling them they were homeless. I'm going to be a movie star. They started saying the same thing. Nigga, you ugly, you skinny, you black, you're homeless, you're downtown. They got actors in New York, Chicago, Atlanta, Chicago, everywhere. You got agents, managers in college and school. How the hell are you going to do it? And I said, you watch, I guarantee it. Even while I'm sitting there looking like a, a homeless uh, a refugee, but I knew it. 
So you can be homeless in your situation, but when you get homeless in your mind, that's when it starts to affect you. But I wasn't mm -hmm. homeless in my mind. I knew it. That's the only yeah. thing I can think of. Yeah. That's great. It's re really uh, odd because just a couple weeks ago with Antonio Pantoa on, and he's a, a director, young director, and uh, he was uh, homeless for a while. And he had a similar uh, thing that, you know, at the time he knew he would, it would get better. And uh, it was yeah, very uplifting and uh, both stories. It's true, man. And, and uh, so many, it's like, you know, when you know, you know, when you know, and I swear to you, I don't know how I know everybody keeps saying hi. And as a matter of fact, there were times when I was young saying, I'm going to be a movie star. And at, there were times my parents said, when I said I was going to be a movie star, I had never watched a television show and if you had stop the whole tape of life rewind and say okay stop, stop go back what is a movie star and i think back now i would have been like how the fuck do i know i have no clue what is a movie star right i don't i don't i never i never i used to well, i remember growing up at least 10 times walking running running getting ready running that's right, because I told you we lived out in the farm, out there, we used to swim in the lake and all that shit you see on Huckleberry Fair. And I remember stopping going, hey, going back and looking in the living room and seeing my arms were all watching this thing. And I'm looking, like, what the fuck? And I look over there, I'm like, what are they looking at? And it was a TV. And I remember at least on 10 occasions this happening going, what could possibly be on that thing that they're sitting in the house watching it? I didn't even understand what was happening. But then I go out and tell everybody I'm a dead movie star. And I don't mm -hmm. remember ever watching television. The only thing we watched was cartoon Flintstones and shit like and and and, and, and be rich. But I don't ever remember anything about seeing anything to say I want to be a movie star. I just remember it was just in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> so I've seen Return of Limit Dead like so many times, but uh so I watched some scenes again for the interview. And uh, nothing against you, Miguel. When Linnea Quigley does the, the dance, I never really paid attention to your her. character. Oh, wow. right, I was watching Linnea. But this time, I was like, I'm going to watch uh, I'm gonna watch Spider. Here. And so uh, you're kind of like the people at home watching. You're really just like uh, looking at her. Do you, do, you remember, do you remember filming that scene and what was uh, what, what you thought was? Uh -huh. Absolutely. I remember saying, I remember, and when, and, and when I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> And, and, and it struck me to say that because in the first one we took, I was just standing up with my mouth open. Uh -huh. And he was like, no, you got to say something. You got to go, yeah, you know, because I, I remember going, I remember going, wait, she can be naked? Yeah, I couldn't believe it. And every now, you go back and look at it again, notice every time we run in, I got her by her hand and I pulled her and held her. Mm -hmm. That wasn't in there. That, I, I, I chose that shit. <laughs> I always grab her hand. Every scene we're running, I got her by the hand, dragging her. That wasn't in the script. I, I did that shit. I couldn't believe this girl could be naked on, on the screen. And people are looking at it. And we'd be sitting there eating. She was so, she was like, well, damn. She sit there with her legs up. They're like, what the fuck? And I can't stop looking at her coochie the whole shot. She was and joking. And after a while, it became nothing. But I just couldn't right. believe it. Yeah, that was one of the scenes. And the, and the other scene, only Eddie Murphy picked this out. The scene when I was crying and he slapped me, and mm -hmm. Murphy picked that out. He said, man, let me tell you something. That shit was real. I'm like, how did you know? Because what happened when we was doing that scene, he kept stopping. And the director said, we can tell you pull him back. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Come on, man. I'm, I'm a man. I can do it. I'm a, I'm a man. Just do it. I'm okay. I'm all right. Just do it. Do it. All right. And he was only supposed to slap me one time. And when we did this scene, he slapped me. Shit out of me. <laughs> And right as this, the, 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 my ears is ringing, and right when I get ready to say, what the fuck? He uh -huh. slapped me again, which I wasn't expecting because it was only supposed to be one time on the uh -huh. screen. And when they say cut, nigga, I charged him. I was going to whoop his ass. And everybody was like, man, what you talking about? I said, you don't hit nobody like that. I had blood trickling down my nose. And you see what I'm saying? He slapped me. He was speaking slap with the one that did. He was speaking to it. So I was expecting the first one, even though it was still hard. But the second one, he slapped somebody or they didn't expect it. Mm -hmm. Man, I was mad as hell. But they said, you told him. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> but not twice. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was like a fan. We had so much fun. Yeah. What do you so think? I don't of think there was ever one mm -hmm. argument. I don't think there was ever one fight. I don't think there was ever one disagreement. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you think that yeah, zombies are so mainstream now? Because uh, you know, you can like no buy like kids shirts with zombies. Uh-huh. I have no clue why they hi- and why and how. The only thing I can think of is probably they're going to be one coming up soon. Because every damn thing that's been on TV in the past, all the Star Wars and watches they had on the first Star Trek, all of that shit here, TV, now that you can do it. Seems like everything that we come up with on TV and our sci fi ends up turning out to be to come out real. I wonder when the hell is a real zombie comes up. What is all this zombie stuff so all of a uh-huh. sudden? Yeah, I even I saw that it. there's I like a zo- Yeah, there's I saw even saw there's some kind of they called it the zombie disease amongst deer somewhere. So Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah, they got that over there already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It'll be so, where you watch. Uh so w- when you uh, auditioned for Friday the thirteenth part five, was it was it called Friday the thirteenth part five yet? Uh, I don't think they told us what it was mm-hmm. when we were auditioning for it. I think they kept it a secret, and then they told us after we got it. Uh, at the time, I mean, I was, you know, I mean, I knew about Friday 13th, but I had no clue. I was like, oh, I'm in a horror movie. It's called Friday mm-hmm. 13th. Hey, you had a Friday. Everybody else knew more because you know, I was struggling <laughs> so long. I really didn't know. I had no clue. Yeah, you had a Friday 13th? No way. Wow. I'm like, what? Is it good? It's a big? It's big? Yeah, I ain't no shit. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> so uh w- when you're doing the the famous scene in the in the outhouse uh can you just like explain what the experience was like because it's a very funny scene that was the first acting i had ever done in my entire life oh wow and they just said okay this is what's happening and then they, they took the front of the door off and they had the camera there and i had to do every single thing crying and screaming and all of that jumping from both sides to the other crying and it was freezing Mm-hmm. And then they said, okay. And then they put the door and all that crying and all those tears, I just did it. I just said, okay, I'm the, he's going to try to kill me. Okay, and I just did it. And they mm-hmm. put the front of the door back on. They took the right side of the door, the wall off. And I had to do it all again from the top to bottom. Mm-hmm. Crying and screaming and all that. Then they put the, that, door, that wall back on. They went over and took the other side door off. The left side wall off. And I had to shoot it all again from top to bottom. Huh. And then it was that. That was that. Yeah. So how did you? I, mean, I so, think my night. I think my na- naivety. Uh, I think mm-hmm. that's how you pronounce. It, how you see it? I, I think it's so. close enough. But, but yeah, there you go. Well, I think that served me well because I just know. I just did what they told me, and to me, I've done. I've never had an acting class. I think that. I think I did exactly what I live by the principle that I have lived by in that scene, and that is. And which I heard later some other actress, uh, famous actress saying it. And my thought was, and it, that was since I was a kid and I didn't get it from anybody. If I just do, say, think, react exactly how you would say, think, react in any situation, I'll never have to act. Mm. So if I'm in this thing and somebody looked down and just saw my girlfriend th- throat slash and now I'm coming back up, I know somebody's out there. I'm not going to be in there trying to be brave and shit. I'm going to be scared. I'm going to be screaming. And then this thing is coming through the wall. And that's what I did. And that's what I've always done. No matter what it is, I'm just going to act, say, think, react exactly how you would in that real situation. And you never have to start acting what you would be doing in there. And that's yeah. what I live by. That's interesting. Uh, when I Tom Noonan on years ago, uh, you know, really famous actor, he had the same kind of uh, approach to acting. He said he he never becomes a character; he just is himself in that situation. And I always thought that was uh, interesting way to look at it. It's the same thing. It's yeah. simple. <laughs> so, uh, how do you prepare for the role of Joanna Man? <laughs> to honor man was hard because you know I've never played for him, never been a woman. I just watched a lot of women basketball, and that's mm-hmm. it. And the rest, I just did the exact same thing, the same exact principle. I'm a guy. I'm dressed up as a woman. What I'm going to do in this situation? What I'm going to do in that situation? It's just uh-huh. a comedy actor, so I know how to to accentuate a beat and make it funny. I can take any any scene and make it make you laugh your ass off. Take the same scene without changing any of the dialogue and make you cry. I, mm-hmm. That's the same principle. But it's a comedy, so I know how to work it. Now, the voice is what I had the most problems with. And mm. I remember we three months, I was I was just trying to look in the mirror, trying. I couldn't figure out the voice. I didn't want to sound like a transvestite. I'm going like, hi, my name's Shawana. Trying to say all of these before, and I just got so frustrated with it. 
and then we came time to shoot. I'm at the and flew to Charlotte, and I had to get there like three hours before the crew, so the light is on. It's just me and the makeup lady and a few people, and our trailer's on. Everybody ain't even there yet, and I'm thinking, I'm looking in the mirror, and I'm like, you know what? I can't do this. Whatever I start with, whatever comes out, when I start, I'm just going to have to stick with it, whatever it is. You know, I'm just going to have to stick with it because I can't, you know. And right at that point, and we shot in Charlotte, North Carolina, and right at that point, the AD, little AD girl walks in from North Carolina and said, good morning, would you like some sweet tea? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, that's it. <laughs> that's uh, it. I'll make the country because when you do it like this, nobody can really tell if it's girl or boy. I was yeah. like, oh, my God, that's it. And that's why I got the voice. And then when I said the scene later on, I said in the scene, I go, oh, I want you to meet this basketball player I met. But she's country as a motherfucker. I added that there just because I can say she's country. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, dude. I like so. it. Yeah. So is, that, is there any special uh, um, uh, special feeling for that movie since, you know, you, can't, you come from North Carolina, you know, on the farm, and then here you are making a big Hollywood movie years later in the same, uh, in, in North Carolina? Is that, what, what was the question? Uh, since you cut, you come from North Carolina on the farm, and then know, years later you're making. I got that. Oh, is, question. oh, I see. So, is there any like a? Is there a? What was? Was there anything? Did that enter your mind when you're making the movie? Was there like a special feeling? Oh no, about no, that? I didn't even know they were shooting in North Carolina. Oh, okay. I didn't even know they were shooting in North Carolina. I mean, I was happy. I had a lot of my relatives were on the film and, and working on it. But at the time, if it would have been now. Mm-hmm. And I know more. I would have been like, hey, I'm in my hometown. Coming back, I would have made more out of it like you're talking about. But to then, I was just shooting a movie in North Carolina. I didn't even think about <laughs> what you just said. Yeah. 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 I was on my way up. So, you know, you don't think about all that shit. Mm-hmm. I want to mention a horror noir because I thought it was a great documentary on uh, a shutter. I had the uh, the directors on and stuff. So, uh, uh, how, how long did, you, did they film when they were uh, filming your part for horror noir? God, oh, I don't even remember. I can't honestly say I don't even remember. I don't remember. Uh, can't tell you. Yeah. You yourself, did you uh, did you face any racism when you were uh, uh, starting out in acting? And has it changed at all? I probably time? did, but like, like I said, I wouldn't even have known it. You wouldn't have, yeah. You would have. I wouldn't have known it. Because my, my racism and other people's racism is different. Because, listen, mm-hmm. I was raised in North Carolina. And my right. thought on race on racism is different because my and it's probably untypical because I'm telling you I was lived and raised in places and I have a different respect for even racist mm-hmm. than other people do because I was from North Carolina and I've seen times when I was be we'd be out in the yard playing with one of my white friends and we know their father and we see them all looking out. This white kid, we young walking out with some white kid loaded it in his truck with the Confederate flag on the window and, and, mm-hmm. and getting ready to go to a meeting. He would go to it. We don't know. <coughs> you know now. And 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 the same time, right as he getting ready to back out of the driveway and he's looking at me and he go, Michael, because my nickname is Michael, get mm-hmm. your little black ass out of the street before you get hit. Looking out for me, mm-hmm. even though he get ready to go to a Ku Klux Klan rally. <laughs> making right. sure I don't get hit. <laughs> yeah. Making sure I don't get hit on his way. Uh-huh. And this is the same man all week now, before we see him do that on like on the weekends, is that we in the house, running in the house, get out of here, put your shoes on. You get the hell out of here. Get your little black ass out of here all day long, but we in his house eating food off his table. And he's you know, telling us the same shit he would have told uh, if his other friends had little white friends in there. And we're running yeah. in and out of his house. And I guarantee, so I have a different, different take on it. I mean, I think there's good people. Trump was right in one aspect. There are good people on both sides. Yeah. Because I know I, I was saved, protected by some racists growing up. Now, I, mm-hmm. don't, I don't condone racism in any part. Now, there was some sure. in North Carolina who I, I was shooting the back of the head myself. Mm-hmm. But I remember being, I looked after one, and these guys were racist. I don't know what they did, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I don't yeah. Coming to Hollywood, I wouldn't mm-hmm. even know. It's because of that experience. Sure. I, lo- I, I didn't really see it the way other people saw. I probably was discriminated against, but I was so busy being me, I didn't even know. Yeah. I probably. No, I'm sure I was. 
Yeah, yeah. I want to ask a few questions here. Uh, people said in when I uh, announced you're going to come on. I want to get to a couple of them anyway. Uh, Dean Knowles wants to know what was it like working with uh, the legend Raul Julia in Street Fighter. I loved Raul Julia. Raul Julia is one of the nicest guys. Calm, just one of the nicest guys you ever work with in your life. And I think that was after after that. I think he might have done the uh, family thing, the uh, monster, that family thing. Oh, yeah, Adam's family. family. Yeah, yeah. Right, I think it was right after us. And he died. Uh, we, yeah. ours, ours was the last one, one of them. And uh, mm-hmm. he was the nicest guy ever. And But I used to always wonder. And then I found out he died of a heart disease. He would come to this set. What the damn? Down the and knock down every tree on the block. Why are you so close to the side, you dumb truck? Um, <laughs> wow. Um, he would come to the, uh, in the mornings and go to the, to the craft service table. And he would get, he would get, all the, the uh, 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 boiled eggs, he get like five, ten more eggs, take all the yolk out, leave the white part, and just eat the yolk. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't never seen that. <laughs> no, that's, never... no, okay, because I've, uh, I've yeah. lost 90 pounds in the, in the last uh, five months because I totally changed my diet, and it's the opposite. I, uh, t- I throw away the yolks and I you know, eat the egg whites. Yeah, yeah. no, not everybody else do too. I've never seen anybody oh. eat the yolk. That's the only fat cholesterol. Right, yeah, it's loaded with cholesterol, yeah. And he would just eat it, and then he would go into the makeup trailer, <laughs> and he uh-huh. would, his head would be completely thrown back on the makeup chair, going. <laughs> <laughs> and the makeup lady would do his makeup while he's asleep with his mouth wide open. Like, you're not going to wake him up. She goes, I've uh-huh. been doing it like this for years. <laughs> Yep, she do his makeup while he's his head thrown back, mouth wide open, snoring, and she was still doing makeup. <laughs> well, she was dedicated. Yeah. And uh, Al Ulb, uh, Al Ulb, according to the producers in John Claude Van Damme, the production of Street Fighter the movie was a nightmare. Do you agree with this? And what are your memories of working on the film? Street Fighter. Yeah. I again, I have no clue. What was going on on the set? When I was there, we were shooting. Da, 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 da. Like I said, I'm so I, I was. If any of that was going on, I promise you, me and Kyla and Mano was somewhere in a corner laughing and joking and telling jokes. All I remember, Kylie Mano became really tight. All I know is we were laughing and joking and having a great time. And if any of that was going on, and to me, and 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 in my in 35 years. That's the first I've ever heard that right now from you. I didn't know huh. that, but I do know this. Claude Van Damme was a trip, but that's all I do know. I don't know <laughs> if, what they were going through, and I and if you know more about it, please tell me because I didn't. I've never heard that ever. Yeah, I didn't know either. I just yeah. uh, Al, Al said it in. Uh, Wes no, wants it could to be know. True. It could be true, yeah. but I, I, I honestly don't know. Right. Uh, Wes wants to know what was it like working on Tour of Duty, and does he have any good stories? He loved that show. Tour of Duty was my favorite project ever. Mm. It was the first show I was ever on. I was 17 years, I'm sorry, 18 years old, and I was living in Hawaii. I remember I was making $10,500 a week. I didn't have a bank account. Every week I got, and I got 22 episodes, so that's 22 weeks, so that's 22 checks. Every mm. check I cashed, I just put every $10,500 in my pocket and spent it. <laughs> 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 I remember we shot at Hawaii. It was the best experience. I remember there were times, and it's so funny you brought this up because I was just thinking about this either last night or the night before. Mm-hmm. I remember one time we were waiting for a helicopter to pick us up to take us back, and it was me, Stephen Cow, all of the cast, and we were sitting on a ledge, on a, not a, a, a mountain ledge, on the side of the most beautiful mountain. It was all green. We were all laying down with our, laying with our head on our helmets. Looking over this amazing, all of these beautiful green mountains, because we were supposed to be in Vietnam, waiting on the helicopter to come and land at the top of the mountain to pick us up and take us home. Thinking about, wow, how beautiful is this, dude? This is going to be amazing. Guys, we are so lucky and so blessed. I think it was, it, yeah, it was a pilot. We're going to mm-hmm. go. This, we are so lucky and so blessed. And I was thinking about that. Uh, the, uh, some of the, uh, the friends on the show that I did, the first show, still my best friend to this day. Wow. Uh, yeah, I just got the phone this morning. 
and uh, we still can stay in touch. It was my favorite project I've ever worked on in my entire career. Oh, nice. Uh, Lee wants to know, what was it like working with Ron Glass on Rhythm and Blues? He always seemed like a cool cat. Ron Glass was the nicest <laughs> guy ever. Ron was just a straight-up guy just did his job, went home, kept everything straight and normal. I ain't trying to hear no drama. He just <laughs> did his work, went home, laid his job out, and watched how I do it, and then just kept on going. Never a problem, <laughs> never, never even anything. He, he taught me how to just do your job, lay it out, and keep it trucking. Very cool. And when someone like it, and, and this is one of the things, like you said, was this going on, was that going on? Always, if you see drama, just walk the other way. You're not involved, and you should never be involved in it. And that's exactly where I left around glass. Uh, we're good. Uh, and uh, Twitter, Save the Wells, wants to know, uh, what are your memories of Slam Dunk Ernest? Slam Dunk Ernest, I tell you, that was another thing that I truly will never, ever, ever, ever forget. One of the treasures I ever had in this business was beating Jim Varney. While people uh -huh. don't know Jim Barney played that crazy ass uh, idiot. Huh? <laughs> yeah. What they don't know is the reason he played that is because he had Einstein type of a brain. He oh, was wow. one of those, what do you call them? Oh, no. There is nobody you will ever be. I remember him sitting in, the, in my room because our rooms were next to each other. We smoked weed together because he smoked weed too. Uh -huh. And I remember that guy start talking and then I found out He's whatever you call it, one of those uh, IQ people. He's in, 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 that, in that group, Mensa? whatever that, that name it up. Mensa? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I remember Jim, him going, and he was going into stuff. And I remember sitting there, and the next thing I know, it was like six hours later, and I, and I was just like, I was at a movie. I could not <laughs> believe how smart the stuff he knew about. He was a genius, a genius, a genius Jim Barney was. Very cool. So I want everyone to yeah. know... Uh, Worth, you can uh, watch now. It's streaming on uh, Amazon Prime and Tubi. And actually, uh, about that, uh, Amazon, you know, all these streaming sites, how does, that, uh, how does that affect the life of an actor? I assume there's, like, more, you know, there's more content, so there'd be more, like, uh, work, work out there. Oh, no, absolutely. There's so much work out there right now because there's so many different avenues now. It used to be the network. Now it's network. Now it's cable. Now it's streaming services. So there's so much, so much. Yeah, yeah, and I also want to mention uh, Tony Todd's also in Worth. It's uh, it was a very good movie. I liked it a lot. And I know it's not horror; it's a horror show, but it's a really cool movie. I think uh, people dig it. Which and, one's uh, that? Uh, Worth, your new movie. Oh yeah, Tony yeah. Todd. I love him. Yeah, yeah, he's the man. So, uh, where can people follow Miguel Nunez? Not like to your house, yeah. but you know, follow online. me at M M Nunez Junior. M N U N E Z J R at I G Instagram. M N U N E Z J R at I G E R M A R, you know, Twitter, M A Miguel A Nunez Jr. Excellent. That was very cool to talk Hi, to you. A lot of fun. My pleasure, man. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye.